president of the UIA, I want to welcome you to this session with respect to telemedicine and the law. We're very happy to have you. This is one of a series of science-related webinars that we've been putting on this week with a uh, participatory panel discussion set for this coming Saturday, where we, where we will be recapping many of the very interesting issues we've covered from AI and unmanned vessels to genetics to today's on telemedicine to uh, climate change. Um, this is our new season of UIA. We're, we have a bunch of things coming up. We have a series of women bar leader days where we will be hosting comments from women bar leaders around the world. Uh, please check out our website. I think it'll be a fascinating and inspiring session that's in, on the 9th, 16th, and 23rd of September. And of course, we have our virtual Congress coming up uh, on October 28th, 29th, and 30th. It's going to be fantastic. We have an extraordinary platform we're using and some really some surprises that we are able to do because we're virtual and not in person. So we'll be able to show some things and do some things that we don't normally have the opportunity to do. We have a very distinguished panel this morning, ranging from here in California where I am, which is why I say good morning, to South America and to Europe. I know it's gonna be a very interesting session. I wish you a wonderful uh, seminar and I look forward to seeing you again at a UIA seminar soon. Thank you all. Simona uh, will be uh, introducing the panel. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I would just like to say a few words to introduce the UIA Science and Law event. And this is the third of a series of webinars intended to bring together scientists and lawyers to discuss issues of common interest, to identify areas for political and legislative action, and more generally to boost uh, cooperation between the scientific community and the legal community. Uh, we at the UAA believe that in a world which is increasingly being dominated by technology, building connections across science technology and law is essential because science helps us describe how the world is, but then we need the law to decide how to use that knowledge. And the same way technology can improve our lives, but uh, its use needs to be carefully and ethically uh, managed. Now, the problem is that often the law can't keep up with the very fast scientific and technological change, but this makes it even more um, urgent, even more important to promote the dialogue between scientists, innovators, and legal experts. So this is basically why we decide to organize these uh, four uh, webinars. Yesterday, we discussed artificial intelligence. This morning topic was gene editing. We are now on the subject of telemedicine. And the day after tomorrow, we will talk about climate change. And of course, there are many other matters of common interest to explore. And in the future, um, for sure, we will have the opportunity to organize more UIA events in which scientists, innovators, and lawyers will interact. But now, I don't want to waste precious time, so I will give the floor to the moderator of today's webinar, Janice Maligan. Janice is a top trial attorney, and she is the president of the UIA Health Law Commission. Janice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simona, and thank you to UIA and ESOF for helping us to put on this interesting seminar. The uh, UIA Health Law Commission is planning its uh, webinars and seminars and hopefully some in-person meetings as well for next year. So if there's any topics that you would like the UIA Health Law Commission to consider addressing, please either send us an email, you will see email addresses on the screen, or perhaps sent us a communication through the Q&A on the screen before you. As well, today, as you hear our presentation, you will be hearing from two top doctors in telemedicine in the world. And you will also hear from a lawyer who's practicing in both Brazil and in Europe, as well as myself. 
questions may arise that you have about telemedicine, if you would please use the Q&A on the bottom of your screen to send us any questions you would like to address today. And if you see a question another colleague has already posed and it's important to you, hit a like next to it so that if we're starting to run out of time, we can see those questions that are most popular with um, the audience. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michaela Zeman Montero. She is a physician, consultant in internal medicine, and also the chief medical officer for digital transformation. She's the former director of the Portuguese National Center of Telehealth. And without further ado, I turn our presentation over to Dr. Zeman Montero. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, and hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor as well. Congratulations to UIA for this initiative. And um, uh, well, I was already introduced, so I will go straight forward to the presentation. Um, uh, this talk is divided into three parts. In, in the first part, I want to share with you some concepts. Uh, of telemedicine. The second will give you the example how it can be embedded in a country's health system. And in the third part, I will present a very concrete example how video consultations have been adopted by a healthcare provider and its patients. And in the end, I will raise some questions, legal questions that uh, I found may, may arise from, from the presentation. So, um, so Telemedicine is the delivery of healthcare services using information and telecommunication technologies. And distance is a critical factor here. It can involve almost all the moments of a person's health journey. But today we are going to focus on video teleconsultations. So what is actually a consultation and what makes a consultation a teleconsultation? And, and why may this distinction be, be useful to our discussion? So the Portuguese central administration, as an example for the health system, uh, defines a consultation as an act in health in which a health professional assesses the clinical situation of a person and plans provision of care. So, uh, and, um, and teleconsultation, is a consultation uh, where a patient and uh, the health professional do not share the same physical space and is uh, mediated by technology. Um, so uh, why, might, why, why might it be useful um, uh, to be a bit fussy about these two, these two concepts? Well, traditional on-site consultation um, Consultations are probably a well-known and comfortable legal space for you, whereas consultations where provider and patients are not in the same room and who are connected by technolo uh, technology are relatively new, at least when we look at how availability and number, uh, numbers have raised uh, in the last, in the last, in the last uh, yes, uh, year, I would say. So, um, so let's dig a little deeper. Let's look at teleconsultation specificities and limitations. Uh, every consultation should always begin with authentication. The doctor should ask, is this the right patient that I have in front of me? And the patient should ask, is this the right doctor? Or maybe even, is this a doctor that I have uh, uh, in front of me? And if the consultation does not take place in the doctor's office, if authentication has to be done via screen and headphones, then it will be much harder to do. Uh, it, will be more, it will be more error prone and fraud uh, will be much easier. Then there is the technology layer. Bad sound or image quality may compromise the quality of information that is exchanged and it may even lead to misunderstanding and even to misjudgment. Um, it may actually be deliberately misused so imagine, for instance, um, a patient recording uh, the consultation without authorization and then publishing parts of it uh, publicly on the internet. And it is, of course, hackable. So unauthorized, unauthorized third parties may access sensible information. Then we must also not forget that teleconsultations have important uh, limitations. A thorough physical exam 
normally cannot be performed. But please have in mind that, doctor, uh, that the doctor often does not need a thorough physical examination for proper assessment. It depends very much on the question, on the problem that has to be solved. And as you probably might have experienced yourself, it is not necessarily performed, the, so the physical examination is not necessarily performed during every on-site consultation. And then uh, uh, in the end of consultation, often, it, it often ends with a prescription. So how does the, the patient get this prescription safely? So you may ask, uh, why, why, why to perform teleconsultations when there are so, so many pitfalls? But there are clear um, winnings for patients, for providers, uh, for healthcare units, and for healthcare systems. So I have listed here some, um, just um, uh, as examples. For instance, for the patient, it may, may be an easy access to medical care. It may increase access to specialized care. You don't need to travel uh, and uh, you don't have travel costs. Uh, it may be easier to combine with other commitments, for instance, with work, traveling, or with caring for children or elderly. And of course, it reduces the risk of exposure to infectious agents. On the provider side, care providers uh, 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 may care for patients. Um, sorry, just. Uh, may care for patients that are geographically distant. Uh, they, they, they themselves can care from, from other places, like now from home, for instance. Uh, so there, there is certain independence from office availability at the healthcare, uh, at the healthcare unit. Um, so, so Larry uh, um, has told uh, uh, recently uh, an interesting story of how uh, you can have insight into social in, the social environment of the patient, which may be important um, as well. And of course, there is the re, uh, reduced risk of exposure for the physicians as well, or for the healthcare providers as well. In our, in our experience, video consultations also take less time than on-site than on consultations. So I lost mine. So healthcare units, um, of course, there is an increased market. Um, a national market, um, an international market. There is increased capacity to scale by on physical facilities. Um, you can increase your physical capacity because you may need smaller offices, no waiting areas, no parking lots. Um, you can imagine new services and uh, reduce obviously um, the exposure risk for your, for your patients and for your um, staff and for the system. If well used, it can increase access to care. If well used, it, it can increase equity and access to, to specialized care. It can improve care integration and decrease cost. And of course, uh, it's of, um, it, 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 from the perspective of, uh, of a public health system, uh, it reduces the risk of, of exposure. Um, so um, just, yeah, okay. Hi Louise, my name is Dr. Kumtar Archer. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you too. So I can see you've completed our AI assessment. And from this, can I confirm that you've been having dizziness for a few months now with some hearing loss and also some ringing in your ears? Yeah, that's right. Okay. You look quite comfortable at the moment. So does the dizziness come and go? Uh, yeah, I don't have it at the moment. Okay. And when you do get the dizziness, how long do the symptoms last? Um, a few hours at a time, I'd say, probably. Yeah. Okay. And does changing the position of your head bring on the dizziness? Sorry, what I mean to say is, do you get dizzy, for example, when you turn your we head can to stop the it one side? So uh, teleconsultations are here to stay. And this was a short video just to, um, to um, draw your attention, to be aware that it soon will become even more complex than I, I, I was describing previously, as new technologies are already entering the teleconsultation space. Uh, and I'm talking about face uh, recognition, as you could see here, natural language processing, as you could see in this small video, artificial intelligence empowered decision support systems, or even robots. These was the first 30 seconds of a video published by uh, Babylon Health. This is a UK-based UK e-health provider. 
and, and show how teleconsultations, um, they provide work from the physician's perspective. And you had the opportunity to see all this technology embedded here in this, in, in this too. Um, so, so, it's, so, the patient's journey is clearly becoming hybrid. That means remote touch points are intercalating with on-site touch points. Human touch points are intercalating with digital or machine touch points. So, oops. So let's come back to concrete examples. Let me introduce you a national telemedicine ecosystem and then drill down to provide and end with, with some legal questions. Portugal is a EU country, as you know, with a tax-funded national health system, but also a private healthcare provide, uh, uh, with private healthcare providers. And I like to see it as a telemedicine-friendly country. It has a national center for telehealth um, to promote and to leverage telehealth. Uh, but it is also one of the leading countries in the establishment of EU, EU cross-border e-prescription and sharing of what we call the e-patient summary and both may become quite relevant for cross-border teleconsultations. So here are some examples of, I would call it building blocks um, uh, that leverage telemedicine in, in Portugal. Uh, and I just want to highlight in here three, the deontological regulation by the Portuguese Medical Board. It basically says tele teleconsultations are fine as long as patient and, phys and the physician agrees on it. It is up to the physician if he or she considers that the assessment through teleconsultation was sufficient to take decisions and to plan care. Then second, financing. The NHS pays 10% more for teleconsultations than for on-site consultations as an incentive. And in the private sector insurance companies, uh, they pay the same so far for on-site consultations and for teleconsultations. And third, e-prescription. E-prescription is mandatory and patients receive their prescription via SMS uh, or email. So um, last year, Portugal launched its national strategy, uh, strategic telehealth plan. Regulation, as you can see, is one of the ident identified challenges. There is an English version of the plan. If you are interested, you can download it. So now, I would like to give you a concrete example for implementation and adoption of video consultation at Portugal's largest private healthcare provider. It's called CUF. This is where I'm actually, um, working now. And CUF recently celebrated its 75th birthday. And in 2019, it performed 2.7 million consultations. It uh, it didn't have, um, there were no teleconsultations so far, but we at COOF were already planning to start with teleconsultation earlier this year, before COVID, but the pandemic definitely accelerated its implementation. Uh, Portugal had the first confirmed COVID case on March 2nd, the country locked down on March 12th, and on the 18th of March, we performed the first teleconsultation, and two months later, more than 1,200 doctors of more than 30 specialties had done more than 20,000 video consultations. So satisfaction among patients and doctors uh, um, uh, have been, have been, uh, has been high. Patients scored 8.7 out of 10 and 93%, uh, almost 93% of the cases, uh, they considered their situation solved by the teleconsultations and doctor, doctors have a similar perspective. Meanwhile, <clears throat> we already performed teleconsultation with CUF clients in France, UK, Luxembourg, Angola, and Sudan. So I hope I could give you a good overview of our topic. Uh, and finally, I would like to share some legal issues that may be worth discussion to, to be discussed. So there is, um, there is for instance, payment. Um, so has the provider the right to claim payment if the teleconsultation could not yield a medical decision or recommendation because of limited physical examination? Then has the provider the right to claim payment if the teleconsultations could not yield a medical decision or recommendation because of technical problems on the patient's side, on the provider's side, or 
undetermined side. Then uh, cross-border provision of care, where does the teleconsultation actually take, uh, take place? At the provider's location, at the patient's location, both locations, where may liability be claimed? And then um, in the what insurances are concerned. Uh, so as teleconsultation uh, become uh, uh, an option within standard of care nowadays, is it acceptable that insurances do not cover reimbursement of teleconsultations? And is it, uh, is it acceptable that insurance is excluded from professional liability? So thank you very much for watching. And um, now I'm curious about uh, my colleagues, uh, my panel colleagues and, and their, 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 their points of views. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Fascinating uh, presentation. It'll be interesting to hear well how different the experience with telemedicine is in the United States. Uh, but before we do that, our next speaker, Eliana Silva de Moray, a friend of mine, as well as a very renowned food and drug attorney, both in Brazil and in Europe. She is a vice president of the Health Law Commission, and it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce you to her to address some of the questions raised. Uh, by Dr. Michaela Simon uh, Montero. <laughs> Eliana, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Jan and uh, Simona Mata for this invitation. It's always a great pleasure for me to attend uh, as a speaker, UIA webinars to talk about uh, challenges subject as we have today and uh, especially we when we are among a distinguished and knowledgeable speaker as today so i hope uh, uh, answer your expectations uh, about this presentation although this subject is quite a um, little new for all of us not a lot of jurisprudence in telemedicine yet but um, I will try to do my best, and especially because you guys gave me an incredible challenge, which is talk about the two big and different regions, Europe and Brazil, and only in 15 minutes. So let's rock, let's do it, because time is a very important thing. Well, first of all, I would like um, all my talk will be based on what we just uh, heard in this incredible presentation from Dr. Michaela Simon. Uh, she has an, an, uh, an experience, in fact, and how day by day how it works. So I'm trying here to give some answers for her presentation based on what we can uh, find now. Although, as I said, it's still new, and uh, besides this uh, um, issue, telemedicine, uh, it does not have only one law to, to make us uh, find the answers and uh, to reflect the, uh, the questions that could arise. But let's, let's try to do this um, efforts. Actually, as I said, it's an exciting uh, subject, and I'm not telling you just as a lawyer, but as uh, a user for somehow all of us at uh, some point will be someone implicated in this subject. So first of all, what I could find in the European uh, legislation uh, is the legal definition. So the provision of healthcare ser services through the user ICT and technology in situations where the health professional and patients or two health professionals are not in the same location. So basically that's what uh, the legislation says. And uh, also we can see that we need to have a good practice and uh, be concerned about the data protection. I, I made this chart here just to, to uh, um, make us see where we are locating telemedicine when we have video consultation. 
And I'm going to stress out much more the Directive 2011-24 because we are talking about the European system. So I'm focusing cross-border protection much more than locally protection, not considering only in Portugal, but if you are in Portugal and we are here in France having this talk. First of all, what we can see is, is a, a trend inside the country, European countries' legislation and the European legislation that uh, we should have, and I, I ask uh, uh, Dr. Mikaela Simon attention this, uh, for the very end of the presentation to let me know if it's true in day by day, but actually, and also Dr. Friedman as well, uh, but the trend is you should know your patient before. I mean, uh, it's not uh, what I, I could my understand, my conclusion about the legislations that I, I read. I'm not talking only about Directive 2011-24, but also Directive uh, 883 and 987. You should know this patient before, not in the first consultation telemedicine. That is what I conclude in the, the first uh, review of um, my studies. Uh, if uh, you can change the next slide, please. Um, and then we were going to, to think about rights. What are our rights as when we are patient and uh, obligations when we are talking from the doctor's side. Uh, in my understanding, it looks like that we are going to have a lot of procedures and papers aside uh, medicine, uh, aside uh, disease, just to protect, especially doctors, but there are also patients because, uh, first of all, we see that we need to have the consent of the patient. We need to explain everything. And if we are talking about cross-border, we need to explain rights from both countries and the mix and the specific uh, issues that uh, we guarantee this patient about. So we need to explain about the reimbursement, if any injury damage occurs, uh, how this patient will be covered. So a lot of procedures, what we have uh, usually in our day by day in food, in food and drug law, I'm seeing day by day doctors now doing these procedures, having papers to protect itself. That's uh, the first thing that uh, I see. Secondly, I was surprised uh, because the, the idea in Portugal saying the doctor can choose uh, if it's telemedicine or not. My understand, this is my uh, own understand because what I did is my homework, reading all legislation and say, wow, that's the, the way. So in my understand, the patient can choose how he wanna have this contact. For sure, if you are not available. Now I take my own experience as a user. If you are not like here in France, we have um, an app he, that calls uh, Dr. Lieb and then we can set up an appointment with a doctor through this uh, uh, technical logical system for us. And then if I do not see the name of uh, Dr. Friedman in there, it means that you are not available. But uh, in the other hand, I think if you are in this list menu, I can choose. Actually, we have these constraints, which is we should have this first meeting before personally. But you see, I've seen here, Jen, a lot of work for us lawyers, uh, jurisprudence being building because I didn't get any point uh, exactly now analyzed by judges here in the European Union regarding this aspect. So that is my, my, my first uh, uh, my first idea. So secondly, uh, what I, I got from colleagues is that I will already talked about this theme uh, and um, for some text that I could read also with my interpretation about the legislation. Once we are in cross-border uh, uh, health assistant, medical assistant, we should um, apply, we should enforce for to this any uh, conflicts, uh, solution of any conflicts, the directive in 2011. And this directive, it's very well done, in my understand, for cross-border patients' rights, which means that uh, it solves some difficulties regarding reimbursement, regarding rights and uh, the law, applicable law, 
to protect uh, its rights. So in other words, giving a brief, brief uh, an idea because uh, time is very short, but in, uh, you, you should that in, in a general view, you should uh, uh, tell your, your patients what rights, what law will be uh, running this relationship. And what I thought is a trend um, of um, a possible jurisprudence to construct this uh, understanding based in an agreement. It is a contractual relationship between doctor, providers, uh, and so uh, patients and the providers, which is everything should be written before to protect more both sides of this relationship. And the law applicable according with my understanding for this general legislation based specifically in this cross-border directive that was written not only for telemedicine but for all kind of medicine assistance, you should link the doctors, um, doctors uh, country of origin. So considering that uh, Dr. Simen is in Portugal, but she always is linked to the medical council here in France. So this is my, my uh, little confusion uh, how we are going to fight this, but I, I still stay more conservative saying will be based in your main presence where you are, you are in Portugal, so you are linked to your medical council. So in my understanding, I'm a pro uh, Portugal legislation to running all this relationship. But as I said, I didn't see any jurisprudence and uh, in terms of uh, European level to say it will be or not uh, the, this, uh, route that uh, the jurisprudence will take. But I, I prefer to think it will be easier to solve any contractual uh, problem uh, establish uh, you, you doing this. But that's my, if, if to conclude Europe, because then it's amazing. Portugal, uh, Europe and Brazil, I need a, a week at least. But anyway, and reimbursement. Reimbursement is the same policy. This, once again, this directive is clear enough as you are here, I'm here in France, I decide, and I'm very happy to know more about this. I can't treat myself in Portugal because it's easier for me as a Brazilian to talk in Portuguese and so on. And then the reimbursement should be based in the same values from I, where I am. And, uh, and then uh, my security should follow the same prices and politics for that. This directive is really clear. and uh, There are a lot of uh, information about how you should um, make this happen. But uh, at, the, at the very end, it looks like it, it will be based and running by the local legislation of a patient for reimbursement, but you have rights. I understand that your security cannot refuse you this assistance uh, regarding all this legislation. But once again, Europe do, do not have only one legislation to interpret these uh, questions. And also we have data protection, other um, interconnections le uh, legislation that we need to consider to form uh, only one opinion. But what I would like, uh, to challenge all of us here is to keep this discussion on. And this is the first of several next uh, maybe meetings that uh, Health Committee, UIA Health Committee will be doing. And to conclude, uh, uh, just next slide, please. Uh, here, um, I'm not going to stress out, uh, uh, Colette, if you can change the slide. Uh, please, um, I'm not going to stress out about the France uh, regulation just because we do not have time, but you are going to have the slide uh, uh, here just to see the, the definition. We have a definition, a decree uh, from 2010, so before 11, but it's uh, harmonized with this European decree. Uh, we have uh, this uh, information about distance, device, communications, security code uh, talking about the reimbursement and then uh, everything is uh, a little bit clear to we started with them providing this kind of service without uh, any panic at all. 
And to conclude, really fast about Brazil, this incredible, beautiful country where I come from, but also crazy country. We have a, a new legislation. I do not know why, because telemedicine, and if you can change the slide, please, uh, Colette. Uh, we have a new legislation for, specifically for telemedicine during COVID pandemic time. I do not understand why Brazilians want to be smarter than you from Europe or US. We have this temporary legislation, which I did not see, and a legislation for exception that uh, organized, that say that uh, patients uh, have the right to treat itself through um, uh, telemedicine. I do not know why we need a federal legislation specifically for COVID if we had before issued by councils, uh, medical councils. But we do have. And uh, Brazil has uh, both uh, system public and private systems to reimburse uh, and uh, secure the uh, uh, health uh, provision service. So uh, it will depend on what kind of uh, relationship we establish directly with the public or private. What I suspect, although I'm a block day here in France, I didn't come uh, to Brazil before COVID uh, pandemic time, is uh, it's much more feasible imagine private sector assurance provided this kind of uh, uh, service for our patients than uh, through uh, public because the technology is not uh, really available in all public uh, uh, health sector in Brazil. But uh, to conclude, uh, and, uh, to give you an overview about how should the Brazilian jurisprudence decide this is everything is pro-patient in Brazil. Based in this article from our constitution, 19, 196, that says the patients in Brazil has rights to access the best, best health medicine uh, service, not only in Brazil, but believe it or not, in the world. So to conclude, even before our pandemic time in Brazil of COVID, I was in Brazil and I had a kidney disease problem and I suspected that, uh, I don't know, uh, my, my apologize, I know that it's not your expertise, but uh, Dr. Friedman and Dr. Simmons are the best one and the disease that I have. I can go to the judiciary and you know, now do a petition and ask for the Brazilian government pay me to treat myself in Europe ever cost reimbursed by Brazilian government. And if we could accept this, a patient take a plane, a hotel, and so on to treat itself before, imagine now with the telemedicine, it will be easy to imagine judges giving these protections for patients just because of our constitution. Some people say, you are crazy, judges are, are, are not, um, aware about the, the reality of the public health, but the judge's answer are, is, this is still in our constitution. And our role as a judge is not to make laws, but enforce the laws. And in, while this article seven and the 906 is in our constitution, we should allow patients have access for the best available in the world and not only in Brazil. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about this subject and uh, um, I am available for any information at the very end. Thank you, Jen and uh, Simona. Eliana, thank you for covering a very complex topic in multiple jurisdictions. <laughs> in such a short period of time. And I invite people to please uh, write us questions. We've, one of the reasons we are racing so fast is to allow people that are in the audience to participate and ask us questions of concern uh, that perhaps we can address. If I may then, before we take that question and answer, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Larry Friedman. He's the Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs and a professor of medicine at University of California, San Diego. He is the founder of the university's telemedicine program, and he's the author of scores of medical publications, including an upcoming peer-reviewed article on telemedicine during the pandemic, 
and his uh, university's experience with treating through telemedicine. Dr. Friedman, I ask you to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the UIA for the invitation and Jan uh, Mulligan specifically for inviting me onto this panel and um, say thank you to my fellow uh, panel mates. Uh, great presentation so far. Hopefully I can live up to their standards. Uh, looks like I may need help with the advancing the slides. Thank you. So as everybody knows, this is about the intersection of law and medicine and how COVID-19 has, uh, has changed medicine really through telemedicine in the United States. So my talk is going to be a, uh, you know, a bit um, U.S. focused, but it's what I know best. Next. So this is just a, for those of you who have not been in, usually when I give a live a talk to a live audience, I'll say, raise your hand if you've been in San Diego. And I'm always surprised at how many people have been to San Diego. It's a terrific place. Uh, it is uh, geographically unique. It's right next to Mexico. In this photograph, this is our, health, our clinical health science campus. Across the, the road is uh, actually a whole complex for all of our basic science and basic research buildings. In the distance, you can see the Pacific Ocean, and to, up to the far left, you can actually see uh, Tijuana, Mexico. So we, we have a very unique uh, location. We, we host many, many medical meetings and conventions in San Diego. So hopefully, uh, at some point, um, everybody listening to this talk will make it there. Uh, next. So, uh, you know, an important way to, to start a conversation about um, actually anything medical or public health related in the United States is to have a, a quick understanding of who's responsible for what. Um, and it's really divided into three different uh, categories, local, state, and federal. At the local level, many health departments, and I'll, I'll use mine um, as an example, have the most control over things like when we open and close schools, when we open and close restaurants, and, and really the response is very much uh, run to the local health department. Some of which are very well prepared for things like the COVID-19 pandemic and some of, some of which weren't and they weren't properly funded. And um, you know, there will be books written about uh, those who were prepared and who weren't. At the state level, um, this is one of the unique things in the United States is that every state in the United States license their own doctors. So I have a license in California and I have a, um, uh, a license in Massachusetts, but I can only, I can only uh, under the sort of the traditional standards in the US, a doctor could only see patients in the state where they held the license. Uh, and the state oversees and disciplines uh, doctors and defines a scope of practice. Uh, at the, the state health department rules and regulations often will um, have a monitoring um, um, a discipline also right now. Now, during COVID-19, and this is really because of the lack of federal guidance, um, you may all know that much responsibility was shifted to individual states, which is one of the reasons we had such a chaotic and have such a chaotic uh, response. But the state has a lot of control also, especially in the last several months when it was ceded to them. And then the governors who lead the states um, have a, a lot of uh, control of what happens at their state health departments as well. So currently in the current pandemic, state law is often uh, what predominates because the federal government has done not enough. They have done one very important thing that relative to telemedicine. So at the federal level, where we should be getting guidance is through the Centers for Disease Control, uh, through NIH, the National Institute of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and also through, well, I put Medicare, Medicaid, it's really the, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is a cabinet level position in the United States. Um, you know, I won't go into uh, the, the, the erosion of trust that's occurred in the United States with all of those federal uh, organizations because of, really because of politics, not be, because of science. Next. Next slide. Thanks. So telemed telemedicine motivation in the U.S. Telemedicine as a technology has been a long, uh, has been around for a very long time um, and has been used, um, I would say, very inconsistently uh, around the world for, for a variety of reasons. I can tell you, though, that in the United States, um, 
the motivation for the rapid rise in telemedicine was twofold. One was really the public health issue where doctors uh, didn't particularly want to see patients who might be sick and patients didn't want to come into a health environment where, of course, everybody was sick. Um, but, and so one of the things that the federal government did do was that they waived, um, they, they, they waived their lack of fees. It's really, I should put it in a more positive. They started paying for telemedicine where they hadn't in the past. They started paying for tele telephone encounters also. And they waived the legal restriction against seeing patients in other states. So as I said before, as an example, I have a license in California. I don't have one in Nevada. But under the, 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 uh, the waiver, I would be able to see a patient in Nevada. Um, now, one of the real questions is, even though I can see a patient in Nevada, and Jen Mulligan is going to respond to my questions at the end, um, but does crossing state, because I can cross state lines, how does that affect the jurisdiction for medical malpractice? Right now, my, my organization, the University of California, covers malpractice for me in the state of California, but is not necessarily prepared to cover my malpractice if I see a patient in Nevada. And how has law sort of kept up with this? Um, it, and, and it's not clear whether this, uh, the law about waiving the state boundaries is gonna be permanent or not. Right now, it's just a waiver. So social distancing, um, you know, as I mentioned, patients and doctors understand the need and find it works well. Um, the social distancing in California started the, the, uh, the, the third week, the 16th of March, I remember it very well, because we had a scramble to, to, to change the way we, we did business and, and did work. But the middle of uh, March is when uh, there was a state mandate around social distancing. Um, you know, and I think one of the, one of the issues that, that's come up already is around, um, you know, the proper use of telemedicine. And I, I think one of the distinctions that's so important is there's a use of telemedicine under normal um, uh, healthcare situations, I guess I will say, when everything is okay, when, when the world is generally right, but, it, but an individual patient may have something wrong with them. I think that there's another um, use for telemedicine that we can't forget, which has to do with circumstances. So there's both acute illness and chronic illness. I think telemedicine is a much better tool in general for chronic illness. In acute illness, you know, I always say it's, you know, what's the alternative, right? If there's no alternative, telemedicine is still what you got. And, you know, the question is what are the legal sort of issues around that? Um, and, um, you know, what happens, patients are afraid to, to come to their doctors. Uh, what happens if because of that, and doctors frankly are trying to do more and more telemedicine, when something's missed? Um, you know, telemedicine isn't perfect, it's best under certain circumstances, but how do you define unusual circumstances? Um, you know, in terms of somebody didn't get their mammogram because they, they, they didn't uh, want to come into a healthcare facility. Who's responsible for that? is a, a question that I think will need to be answered uh, over the coming months. Next slide, please. So the, the University of California, San Diego response to COVID-19. So what did we do? By February, uh, the County of San Diego knew something was different. New York City uh, created a national urgency and, and frankly, throughout the United States and the healthcare community, we all, <clears throat> we all, sort of imagined or thought that what happened in New York City might happen in all of our cities. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen in, in many cities, including mine. <clears throat> but the weekend of March 14th, UCSD launched online telemedicine training for providers and staff. Uh, we don't allow doctors to see patients using telemedicine unless they go through two online tutorials and pass them. Um, and it really has to do with um, compliance and charting and, and documentation and that kind of thing. Uh, templates were converted to virtual visits. We converted, as I said, well, primary care converted 100% um, of their visits. I'm sorry, 100% of the doctors were trained. And within a week in primary care, we went from almost zero telemedicine visits to nearly 80% of all of our visits were by uh, telemedicine. It was probably more than 80%. There was very little uh, um, patient, uh, direct patient uh, interactions. And, and of course, we were trying to keep people with respiratory symptoms that might be COVID related out of the clinic. Uh, and, and somebody like that is, is really a perfect candidate for telemedicine. They can stay home, they can see their doctor, they can see their nurse, they can see their provider, 
and don't have to come in where they put other people at risk for being at risk for being infected. So by March 19th, there was a statewide shelter in place and social distancing order, which really sort of put the lid on uh, any kind of in in person uh, encounters for for you know for a while. Next slide. So this is what happened. Um, and this is, this is not just the University of California, San Diego. This is a composite slide from us, from San Diego, from uh, uh, San Francisco, Davis, UCLA, and UCI. Uh, some of you may know that uh, UC San Diego is a sister organization with those other University of California health systems. Combined, we're one of the, if, if not the biggest health system in the United States, uh, but when we have six health science campuses. The, the blue lines there, um, you can see, and this is for all, this is all the campuses combined. These are face-to-face -face ambulatory visits in blue and telemedicine in green. And you can see that, um, and this is ambulatory again, not in the hospital. You can see that uh, the, the predominantly blue lines uh, up until the middle of March, almost all the visits were, were in-person face-to-face. And you can see that very abruptly, the green lines uh, are telemedicine and they actually, uh, there were more, tel and, and again, this is across all of ambulatory care. So it would include gastroenterology, cardiology, where they also have procedural areas. Um, and then you can see that uh, by, by middle of May, things started to change back to, to about 50-50. Right now in, my, in San Diego, we're about 50-50 in, in person and face-to-face -face visits. We expect that we will, uh, in the future, uh, settle on about 30% of all of our visits in primary care being, by, being virtual and, and by telemedicine. Uh, next slide. So the, uh, the US telemedicine experience so far related to COVID-19, for the patients, it's been good, it's convenient, it maintains social distancing and avoids urgent care and ED co and costs uh, more or less are equivalent. We're, we've been doing surveys of patients and actually patients uh, patients, um, um, to, for the most part, really like telemedicine visits. Uh, they understand, you know, they understand the circumstances. Um, you know, a face-to-face -face visit at many of our clinics is, is sort of a half a day production, whereas a telemedicine visit can be done in 20 or 30 minutes, and you can do it in your living room or home or wherever. Uh, the not so good is some patients want to be seen, some uh, with technical challenges. Uh, some people don't know how to use the equipment they have, or they may not have equipment. They may not um, have adequate uh, internet connectivity, or they may not have, may not have any connectivity at all. Uh, and so, and many visits still need to be seen in person. Telemedicine isn't a way to see all patients all the time. Um, but, and so you do, do need to have selection algorithms for who is appropriate. From the provider point of view, uh, convenient social distances, reimbursement now is in effect. Um, and um, you know the, the the example I've given from one of my doctors, which is you can you can have a glimpse into a patient's home environment. Um, we tell the story of a, one of my doctors seeing a patient with diabetes who was at home uh, drinking a regular Coca Cola as he was having this conversation. And obviously, he needed a little bit of extra uh, diabetes education, um, and it was a you know it was something that he casually did and and never brought up. So. Uh, clearly, he needed some work on his diet. So the not so good for providers is, um, you know, there is a concern in, in the medical community for, for good reason about missing um, um, uh, serious conditions and the potential legal uh, implications. From the payer point of view, um, patients are getting seen without using urgent care AED. There's a short-term uh, financial windfall to insurance companies. People are not coming in to being, get, get seen. The insurance companies are not paying the bills for mammography, colonoscopy, for blood tests, for you know, a lot of things that routinely should be done. I think that they will, they will be seeing those, those, those bills after things clear up. But, and people will be coming in with much more advanced disease too, which in the long run will be more expensive. Um, next slide. So lessons learned, governance matters. Don't wait for a crisis. Uh, written policies and procedures are essential. One of the questions is, should there be national standards, international standards, especially around things like consent and privacy and documentation? Uh, required training materials for providers, we mandate that at our place. Um, someone had to help patients, uh, hardware, uh, uh, how to use the hardware and the connectivity. We were lucky, we had medical students who were very eager to help teach patients how to get online. So the legal question is, how do you respond to inequities in care, connectivity, education by, rate, by race, 
age and so socioeconomic factors. And that, as I said before, we suspect about 30% of all of our ambulatory visits after the pandemic will still be by telemedicine. Next. So some significant telemedicine, telemedicine threats, research propagation of false claims about unproven treatments. I personally am very, very concerned about in the United States rushing approval of vaccines until they're proven and safe. I think the safety uh, issue is probably not as much of an issue as are they even effective. Um, and there's a whole other talk to be given about what's happened to the, the trust that uh, does no, long, no longer exists in the United States around some of our, our most important uh, institutions. Public health uh, departments, depending on the location in the state, are grossly underfunded and unprepared. Uh, and then in, in the medical community, fear of health system will delay prevention, testing, and treatment, as I said before. Who's responsible for late detection when colonoscopy mammography are available but delayed? Uh, professionals providing care when they're not experienced or trained. What's the community standard when providers are not otherwise properly credentialed and certified? and there are no appropriate providers around. This was a, a big deal in New York City back in uh, March and, and April when it was uh, so bad there. They had recent trainees uh, taking care of patients uh, in the ICU without proper certification. And I think that happened other places as well. Uh, and I don't know what the liability is if, some, if, if something went wrong, basically, I'll, I'll put it at that. We had an unprepared, untrained uh, doctor taking care of a, a COVID patient but there was nobody else available. Um, and there's gonna be, there will be uh, community hospitals and, pr and practices that go out of business in the United States. I think some of them already have uh, because of financial strain. Next. So what will the future bring? Return to trust in the government and public health in the US, that's gonna take a long, that's gonna take a while to rebuild. Uh, I trust is a hard thing to, uh, to, to regain, especially when there's been such a an undermining of uh, credibility of some of the most respected scientists in the US. Return to globalization. We're all connected and we are whether we want to be or not. New debate over insurance coverage for all. Um, that's still gonna, you know, is still yet to be played out in the US. This coming election is gonna um, at least have some role in that. Widespread adoption of telemedicine and remote monitoring uh, is here to stay, as I said. Um, New knowledge of viruses, prevention, and treatment. When we do uh, have treatments and vaccines, we obviously will have gained a lot of knowledge about other viruses also and will hopefully prepare us. And then uh, uh, trying to clarify the role of the federal versus state and local public health decision makers. And in the future, hopefully we will be drinking wine and not bleach. Uh, that is all of our aspirations so we can next year all meet in Italy. Uh, next slide. So this is, uh, Jan alluded to, uh, to this uh, earlier on the left, upper, upper left-hand side is a, 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 a paper we published about uh, 10 years ago, a little less than 10 years ago in academic medicine about how to start a telemedicine program in an academic medical center. And below is, a, is a, um, an article that we just got accepted. It's not published yet, but it should come out in September in the journal Telemedicine and eHealth. And it's really what we did, this, this paper was written by the first week of April. It was really what we did to be able to be up and running so quickly in our organization uh, where we have really pervasive telemedicine capabilities now. Next. So I'll leave you with this, uh, with this slide. Um, you know, nothing is gonna, nothing, it is, it, is, it is crucial that we regain trust in our public health system. I'll, I'll leave it at that without going into too much, um, too much uh, politicizing of this, but uh, it's going to take a while to, to rebuild uh, worldwide trust in the United States and especially in our public health institutions. And, um, you know, this is the upcoming election in the U.S. in some ways is a, is a referendum on uh, science versus politics, I guess. Um, so anyway, any of you from the U.S. who are voting, um, just vote. I won't say anything else. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. I'll uh, collect if it's okay. I'll take over the slides if you advance for me. Thank you very much. So I represent patients uh, and the, let's see if I can do this. Okay. And the issues that are raised about telemedicine, um, they're both 
short-term questions and then long-term questions. While the medicine for uh, telemedicine and the technology existed for a long time, as you have heard, in the United States, until the pandemic hit, it was very difficult to practice telemedicine across state lines. Then with one fell swoop, telemedicine became very popular because of the current federal US waivers. They relaxed all of the laws that had uh, previously existed that prevented the spread of telemedicine. Unlike Europe, where Eliana has told us that there must be a pre-existing relationship between the doctor and the patient that is no longer required in the United States before a telemedicine visit is allowed. However, these broad waivers that have allowed the flourish of telemedicine are only temporary. The question is, what happens when the pandemic is over? Do we revert to our old ways it's hard to put, as they say in English, the genie back in the bottle. Once it has been opened, and we now know that patients like telemedicine, the doctors enjoy it, what is going to happen when the pandemic ends? Uh, well, we need more legislation, more laws, federal and state level. We have to make sure that payment will continue to be allowed. The federal government pays for Medicare for people over 65, if they continue to pay for telemedicine and private insurance follows, that will help greatly. But a bigger issue is about uh, the jurisdiction crossing the borders. As you have heard from our colleagues in Europe, they are lucky because the EU has that where the doctor is located is where jurisdiction lies. So we know the doctor is licensed to practice in their own country. Therefore, there's not a problem if, um, if the doctor in Portugal wants to treat a patient in Angola. I think Dr. Seaman, you said that's a, an absolute, you know, an actual thing for you. Um, in the United States, without the current waivers, there would not be that luxury. If Dr. Freeman would like to treat a patient in Texas or he'd like to treat somebody in Indiana, once this waiver is over for the pandemic, he would have problems with it because our system is that where the patient is located is where the law applies. And from state to state, it's variable as you can see. Uh, so if Dr. Freeman or another California doctor chooses to treat somebody in Texas, they will have a problem. Because if the doctor is unlicensed where the patient is located, their malpractice insurance will not cover them. They will have criminal penalties. Specifically in Texas, it is a felony, which a felony in the United States is a criminal act that's punishable by a minimum of one year in jail if it's enforced. There's no protection for state laws. For example, California has a cap on damages the most the doctor can be responsible for is $250,000 for general damages, as well as no cap on specials. But if it's a doctor from a different state providing telemedicine to a California resident, that protection doesn't apply. When the pandemic is over, it creates a huge problem. And these are the issues that have prevented telemedicine from being popular in the United States before our pandemic. So what's the solution? Well, one solution is that the United States could follow the lead of the EU and enact federal law changing jurisdiction to be where the doctor or the provider is located. That would, in one fell swoop, take care of many of these problems. However, the consumers don't like it because then a patient in California who's treated by a doctor in New York would have to go to New York to bring a lawsuit, would have to follow New York laws, even though the patient never has been to New York and never agreed to the jurisdiction. There's also opposition to having jurisdiction be where the doctor is located from doctors. While generally all doctors would like to be able to treat patients everywhere, there is a very uh, political motivation for the doctor not to want out-of-state providers to take their own patients by providing care to the doctor's patients in their own state. So this is a problem and the doctor's groups and the consumer groups oppose the change in legislation. 
So what do we do if there's no federal legislation to permanently make these waivers in place? The only other thing is what they tried to do, they being the, uh, the governments in favor of telemedicine tried to do in the United States before the pandemic. There's an interstate medical licensure compact where the medical licensing boards from the 50 states came up with a general compact or set of guidelines and asked the states to join in it so that if you, your state was a member of the compact, at least there could be an exchange of doctor treating patients across borders. But so far, only 19 states out of 50 have agreed to that. Another question raised in medicine is, what is the liability if something is missed due to a telemedicine visit that would have been caught face to face? When uh, Dr. Seaman Montero showed us the video, we see how the patient is talking to the doctor, but it's difficult to conduct the physical exam <laughs> looking in the patient's ears, looking down the mouth, palpating to see what's going on. So of course, it's more difficult to make the correct diagnosis on the screen than it would be in person. However, it depends on what the law is going to be. New York is one that has a lot of protections for doctors and the waiver that existed right after the pandemic said unless there was gross negligence, a really big mistake or something done intentionally, recklessly, there would be immunity. Now New York is starting to roll back that general immunity and providing that it, you have to have the care impacted by the effort to respond to the pandemic. So if I am treating with you, uh, Dr. Freeman, across a border, and your treatment has nothing to do with the pandemic or COVID, uh, you know, is there going to be protection if you miss the fact that I have a big lump behind my ear, but you couldn't tell by touching it? Common sense tells us you shouldn't be responsible, but the law is not so clear. Why? Because technically in the United States, the standard of care for telemedicine is the same for an in-person visit. Telemedicine is supposed to be a tool, not a separate form of expertise. So unless there's a different or relaxed standard of care, there's a problem. So what is a doctor to do? Uh, recommendation from the lawyer here would be to triage the patient and if there's any question, refer the patient to an in-office evaluation or a, a specialist for diagnosis and follow-up treatment. Easier said than done though with the pandemic. Another question is, should there be national standards? How can you have this quilt, if you will, of 50 different states with substantive laws very different and expect a physician to be able to know what to comply with? it would be easier to have a national standard. But the devil's in the detail. Whose standard applies? There's very many overlaps in medicine between specialties. So does the ear, nose, and throat specialist have their guidelines apply? If a primary doctor is doing an evaluation of nose, ear, and throat? Or what about plastic? Would that apply? Plastic surgeon, if it involved issues common to that? What about general surgery versus others of specialists and subspecialists? Whose rules apply? So this is one of the problems in our country if we want to have uh, guidelines. In a perfect world, yes, it makes perfect common sense to have consistency and to have uh, national standards, but it's very difficult in the United States. Another question, and this is unfortunately uh, global, what do you do about inequities in care? What about the person that cannot afford uh, internet connection? What if they can't afford the, uh, the computer or the smartphone to allow it? What if they don't know how to use the equipment? Dr. Friedman mentioned that university is lucky because they have medical students to help train people, but that's not always the case everywhere. So these issues need to be discussed or the gravity of the haves and the have nots will become even larger as the medical system becomes more sophisticated and relies on technology. 
one or a couple of examples of how to, if you will, try to uh, narrow this gap in inequity is by looking at what is taking place in, at least in some institutions in the US. There are think tanks, there are uh, statewide initiatives to try to prov provide funding, to provide internet access, computers and training. This doesn't have to be just for telemedicine. We have the same issues with respect to students in school. And if you have poor students, how are they supposed to learn remotely? The same training programs to teach the students and to provide students with access to care can be used to also help to provide our, our poorest and most vulnerable members with access to telemedicine. What will happen when the pandemic is over? Well, we need to have an incentive for telemedicine to not only remain in existence, but also to thrive. One idea is payroll tax credits also building on existing programs. We are used to telemedicine in our life and we should allow it to flourish and not to allow this hodgepodge of different laws in different states to rein it in and make it difficult to go back to the past, if you will, when telemedicine was very difficult to have implemented across country. Then the question comes up, we've heard from our speakers today about the delay in routine care and how if 2008 a financial crisis caused people to lose insurance, which of course, because we have no national health in the United States, meant many people could not afford to get care. They had to choose between food and medicine. What do you do? Well, if you're a physician in the United States, do you have to worry about legal responsibility for a patient who has late detection because a colonoscopy, a mammography were required, they should have been done, but they were delayed or canceled altogether. Well, in the US in general, I mean, it differs from state to state, but if there's a delay in providing uh, testing or providing follow-up care, then you have to look at the causation. In other words, whose fault was there that there was a delay? And what are the damages that flow from it? Again, you're hearing today that uh, all 50 states in the US have different laws. And so here I used one example. What if there's a delay in diagnosing cancer? What difference will it make for liability? Well, where I live in California, if the patient would have likely survived had diagnosis and treatment been rendered promptly, then there might be a cause of action for the delay, but only if the survivability was affected by the delay. So if March, when the pandemic occurred, it had the person had the cancer diagnosed and treated and statistically would likely have survived for another 10 years, and now because of the gap in time, this aggressive cancer was not treated, can that person recover? In California, only if now their survivability is less than 50%, 50, five, zero. Some states don't require that. Some states say if there's a diminishment in the life expectancy, that alone is allowing for a lawsuit. Is it fair? What is fair in this area? But what we need to do are identify these issues and problem solve what to do about them. Personally, I think it would be almost impossible to convince a jury, assuming we ever get our juries back right now, the jury trials in the US have been pretty much put on hold except for some criminal cases, but assuming we could ever get to a jury, who is gonna hold a doctor liable for not doing a mammogram in April of this year when the pandemic hit? Because people on the jury know our doctors are our heroes, you're saving lives. It's not practical to have required that a mammography be done. And even if it was done, then where are you going to go for the care without exposing yourself to further risk? So it, there's the common sense approach versus technical legal answer. But the gap between the two is not sustainable. What is the community standard when the providers are not properly credentialed and certified? I've heard Dr. Freeman talk about New York where medical students were the only ones that perhaps available in certain circumstances to treat the patients. Well, 
technically the law is you have a duty to refer to a specialist or if you don't refer to a specialist you will be held liable as a doctor however again under the pandemic all bets are off waivers are in existence for now in most states in california however the waiver is only for emergency medical care so if it's unrelated to the emergency medical care there is no waiver you still have problems crossing borders so if i wanted uh dr um, seaman montero to treat me please here in california and it's not related to covid and you are kind enough to provide me with your excellent medical care then doctor i am so sorry to tell you that in california you will be held accountable to answer to a jury and there will be no caps on damages because you are not licensed in my state there is a key case out of colorado where a doctor was held liable for manslaughter because he provided uh, medicine prozac to a patient who then committed suicide and california said i don't care if you never came to california to provide that care and that prescription for prozac you didn't see the patient in person you provided too much prozac he was suicidal he killed himself now you have a criminal law to answer to it's kind of scary and it has a chilling effect on the ability to provide telemedicine at least in my state good thing we have dr freeman in the uc california is such a big state that our answer is we don't have to cross borders <laughs> in most circumstances but not all are so fortunate so these issues remain to be resolved and we will see what the future brings thank you We're now going to turn it over to questions i would ask that uh, please if you would uh, send us questions uh, through the system there's one question here and i will leave it uh, for the doctors to first address and then and perhaps the lawyers chime in afterwards does a talking consultation through whatsapp um, does it uh is it considered a doctor's appointment what's the medical perspective on that doctors sorry sorry i was muted um so so what's that so i may not know all the details about whatsapp but it is a application i use for social reasons um i my my first response is it's not a secure system and so it should never be used for an official medical consultation. That, that said, I, I know that it is. Um, you know, there, at least in the US, there are definitions, uh, there are true definitions about what constitutes a medical visit. Um, is it scheduled? Is it documented? Uh, do you have an established medical record number in the, in the health system that you're talking about? And it was it billed for. To, in, in most cases, that would, to me, establish a, a true medical visit. Um, in terms of the, 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 the information that gets transmitted, it may or may not be just as good as if, it depends on what the problem is. But, but there are legal issues that need to be done to make it an official visit. And I'll hear my colleague's perspective on it too. Uh, well, I totally agree. It has more to do with, obviously, the, 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 um, the tool used, in this case, WhatsApp, um, has, should be a, a safe, secure, um, technical tool to do it. Um, but more important is that um, um, the information is registered and uh, in, in the proper uh, medical health record that is, um, that is um, attributed to, that, to the patient and, and, and that um, correct authentication of both is registered as well. So that we know that uh, patient A has talked to that doctor B and, and, and then that this encounter is probably, prob probably registered. I think this is more defining uh, the consultation. Uh, for all my legal perspective is, uh, one thing is uh, what we have here in Europe um, and uh, fortunately we have this common market and that's why doctors can uh, provide service. This is one of the reasons of this common market in European Union. But um, well, one thing that is important for the legislation regarding telemedicine is payment. We need to have, as I said, it's a contractual relationship and one of the link of this contract is payment. And WhatsApp 
we can have uh, two perspectives and I thought different uh, uh, opinions about uh, mostly saying, well, if you are not doing appointment by payments and this is nothing, this is not the tools for this relationship to be established and we need to have the consent and so on. But I got some um, opinions very hard and uh, especially locally because we are talking about cross-border protection, but the European Union, each country has its uh, legislation. So I saw some countries that um, lawyers especially uh, are defending that this is an op a medical opinion and according with uh, your opinion, maybe I can take some procedures, you know, and then they understand you have liabilities regarding this opinion. Uh, but it's not uh, clear enough and I don't see this like a telemedicine issues but uh, doctors' uh, liabilities, generally speaking. Dr. Uh, uh, Montero, did you want to add something to that? You did, or No, not to this, to this point, no. Okay, sorry, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, from the consumer advocate's point of view with WhatsApp, uh, I see the problem also as one of privacy that WhatsApp, you know, if I share a computer with others, it's e it may be easy to access it versus the UCSD, when I have a telemedicine visit, the authentication that they put me through before they give me advice is considerable. Um, I even have to show my identity, my driver's license at the beginning of the visit on the screen after I've gone through this two-step process of authentication, whereas with WhatsApp, uh, that may be somewhat relaxed. So the issue of hacking um, also comes up with the cybersecurity aspect. So the, the platform's own security may also be an issue, um, and that, that would be a problem. Is there anything else on this issue before we go on to the next question? Okay. The question is asked, if an in-person consultation, uh, what happens legally if a patient who lives in New York travels to be evaluated by a licensed doctor in California, there's a medical error identified by the patient after the return to New York? Does the lawsuit have to be made in California and shouldn't it be the same for telemedicine? Well, let's take it one at a time. Um, if a New York resident comes to California, they've accepted jurisdiction in California by entering our state. That or if there's a medical error with a doctor being seen in California. So yes, jurisdiction is in California under those circumstances. Should it be the same for telemedicine? Yes, perhaps it should. But the inconsistency is not uh, due to anything other than the politics of it. So for telemedicine, if one looks at the fact that doctors are very um, jealous if you want to protect their patient pool in their own state. So Texas makes it a felony for a, a doctor from California to provide care to a Texas patient because Texas doctors don't want California doctors treating Texas patients. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a problem with technology. This is more a question of uh, politics and lobbying money being spent to the state legislatures to protect the turf, if you will, of the doctors in the state. And for the consumer, it is cheaper and easier to bring a lawsuit in your own state, so they're not going against this either. But yes, the question is an intelligent one. There should be consistency between the face-to-face -face meeting and the uh, online telemedicine, but, un but unfortunately there isn't. Would anybody uh, like to add something? Yeah, you know, one thing that that makes me think of is, um, you, you know, I, I sort of mentioned this pandemic has caused severe financial hardship, especially to smaller healthcare providers in the US, both individual practices and also hospitals. And uh, there are hospitals that have gone out of business be because of the cost 
of, of uh, the pandemic. And I could go into that separately about why the cost was so high. But I think what, what may happen, especially if the waivers are, are relaxed and say permanent, is that in the US as a consequence of this, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, is that we're gonna see the expansion of the big national systems that exist today. So Johns Hopkins on the East Coast is gonna to continue to expand because they'll be able to take over weaker practices. Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic already have moved into surrounding states and around the country. And I think we'll see the, um, the aggregation of even more systems into, into a uh, relatively smaller uh, group of huge systems. The University of California you know, plans to be one of those big systems. Collectively with all six of our campuses, we see the majority of patients or have seen the majority of patients in the state of California. But I think that there will probably be the continuation of small practices and small hospitals going out of business in the US. And it's gonna force this issue even more. Others? Um, technically, in the United States, uh, a case could be brought in federal court under diversity of jurisdiction if you have a patient in New York that wants to sue the California doctor uh, after an inpatient, you know, face-to-face -face visit. You could have diversity of jurisdiction. I don't think the federal courts want that to be the solution to this problem, however, for telemedicine, because it would flood the federal courts with routine medical malpractice cases um, and, and so while technically that exists and could allow a federal case to be brought in New York by the New York patient against the California doctor claiming diversity in jurisdiction, but uh, the federal court has the right to kick it, if you will, and either transfer it to California federal court or to dismiss and stay it's a state court action. Um, when Dr. Freeman raises the issue of small hospitals going out of business because you have these larger conglomerates pra practicing medicine across state lines, another thing that existed before the COVID pandemic to assist telemedicine and even robotic surgery was to have a doctor licensed in the state where the patient was located bedside. I see Dr. Freeman nodding towards that. Can you, you tell us a little bit more about your experience with that? Well, um, yeah, so, so the, the model that we've set up to do um, uh, telemedicine, this is before the pandemic, but we, we were well on our way. So for instance, we do telemedicine in, in China, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia. We happen to have contracts in those countries, but we do it in a model where we have a, part, we have a doctor locally who's licensed in that country who becomes our partner and we provide a second opinion to the doctor, not to the patient. And so we really sort of set up a consultative model which is more educational than anything to advise the doctor locally about what our opinion is. That's worked quite, so that, 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 and that's obviously been through a series of University of California attorneys, which is to say something, to, to get uh, permission to do that. So that, that potentially could be a model across the United States also. As long as you're working with a licensed doc, a doctor who's licensed locally and they're making all the decisions uh, and, and taking care, doing the prescribing and so forth, I think that's a, a way that things will start loosening up also. Did that answer the question, Jan? For me, it did. I, for our audience, I hope it did. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sieben Montero, is there anything that you would like to add about this or anything else? Uh, something else. I just, wanted, I just wanted to clarify two things. Uh, I may, may have not been so clear in my um, uh, in my uh, in my talk, uh, so um, doctors and and patients have to give their consent to to perform a teleconsultation. So it is it is not enough that one wants and the other, but the other part has to do a consent. And the doctor at any time can say, so the information that I get uh, through this teleconsultation is not enough for me to make the decision. So as you pointed out. Uh, Janice with a lump. <laughs> uh, uh, so the doctor can say, so I, I really have to, 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 to check on you physically uh, to, to, to make a decision. So this uh, I'm, I, 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 uh, could have not been so clear when I, when I talked. Then just, just, another, just another thing regarding first consultation and follow-up consultations. Of course, it is, it is easier 
and uh, when you already know when you already know the patient because of many many things you have uh, already the history of or there is already uh, uh, um, um, you have already established a, 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 a patient doctor um, relationship uh, and so on but um, in Europe uh, teleconsultations are also used and uh, increasingly used for first um, uh, for first encounter. So there are many insurance companies. In Portugal, uh, uh, there are two or three uh, of the big insurance companies who do that, but um, uh, uh, beginning in the last years. But there is a history, for instance, in, in, in Switzerland, which is not in a EU country, but in Europe, um, where um, there is, a, there, uh, where insurance companies even, uh, even, um, even ask for a first teleconsultation before a, a, an on-site consultation. So there is, for instance, a big, uh, there is a, there is a, um, um, a company which is called Madgate, uh, which uh, operates for 20 years. They started with telephone teleconsultations and more recently they are doing video consultations. And uh, what they report, and they do it this uh, for these insurance companies, uh, and what they report, is that they have a 50% um, in 50% they can solve it uh, even if it's a first encounter um, and they have a feedback loop of um, outcomes so it seems credible to me and then there is another there is another example for instance in Denmark which is which has a national health system it's not insurance based um, primary care physicians in out of our practice uh, they for, also for 20 years they do outpatient they do uh, teleconsultations via phone um, uh, for those people who out of hours which is from 6 from 4 p.m which is very uh, <laughs> it's early where the Danish people are out of hours early in the day it's 4 p.m um, until 8 p.m the other 8 a.m the other day and of course at at weekends and and they 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 and in in, in about 60 percent um this uh, uh this 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 encounter and as a teleconsultation and in 40 percent they it's like a triage to uh, a, a, an on-site uh, consultation so just just to to give these examples uh, in order to, yes, uh, just to, to give these in examples to enrich a little bit the view on, 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 this, on this topic. Thank you. Interesting. Eliana, anything in close? Oh, I, uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, giving, uh, taking these words of Michaelos, Dr. Michaelos. Yes, uh, as I said, it is a trend. Not necessarily, but uh, some of the strategies I understand from the reimbursement side, from security providers that want to create uh, some difficult to not uh, uh, provide a lot of telemedicine for no reason. Uh, but it's a trend. It's not exactly in the law because, as I said, there is no specific law. And uh, to conclude, my final word is, uh, it was fantastic to have this opinion, especially for me that I'm uh, from Brazil, I'm here in Europe, and then I can get the more information. I was surprised that when I thought this new legislation coming from Brazil, specifically for pandemics time, but now I can understand the legislator's mind because we follow much more US uh, uh, mentality and ideas it was necessary to save uh, uh, any troubles that could maybe arise after pandemic times regarding responsibility. That's why uh, Brazil maybe uh, uh, passed this law specifically for pandemic times to give an exception and more protection for doctors that are exposing itself to respond, uh, to answer quickly as quickly as possible for patients that are maybe uh, with the COVID. That's, so thank you for this great opportunity to get this overview. It's really rich for my activities and uh, to keep uh, constructing uh, some ideas about this uh, important subject as telemedicine. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, any closing comments? I just thank you for being part of this panel, for being invited. Um, I thought it was a terrific session. Um, it's, it's really delightful to be members of a panel with my colleagues. Uh, you guys are great and hopefully 
we'll do it again, but maybe, maybe the next time we do this, which won't be too far in the future, we'll be looking back at the end of the pandemic, what really were the lessons learned. So I'm not sure we're gonna really know the lessons learned until we're able to look in the rearview mirror. But we will all look forward to drinking wine and not bleach. <laughs> <laughs> thank I'm already you so training. <laughs> thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much and, and stay well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.